Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we can talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. Listening to Jams and Tea. Hello everyone and welcome to the Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast where we cover a recommended album by one of the members of this podcast every single week. Uh, if you haven't already checked out our episode weekly, that has been uploaded before this. Go check that out where we review Whole Lot of Red and Man on the Moon 3. But right now, we are going to be talking about Sersha's recommended record, which is Drinking Songs by Matt Elliott. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Matt Elliott mm, and I'd love the to drinking do songs in question? So Matt Elliott is a uh, British music artist. He's now located in France, uh, but he came from Bristol making electronic music under the name Third Eye Foundation. Um, the first album of which came out in 1996. Um, he, he has since started making dark folk music under his uh, own name, Matt Elliott, in total between the two projects, uh, which do cross over with each other. Um, sort of a microphone to Mount Airy situation. Um, he has released 21 records in 24 years. Um, Damn. He is a busy lad. Um, I've listened to a few of them. I think his latest record, um, A Farewell to All We Know, is great. Excellent. Um, I made it onto my 2020 topster. Um and I think that this record is the, the pinnacle of what he does. Um, it is dark, it is sparse, it is um, very, very depressing, and it mixes genres like a motherfucker. Um, the cover art for me evokes the life story of Edgar Allan Poe, as do many of the plot lines. Edgar Allan Poe, of course, a, a gothic horror writer um, who famously was a drunkard and died penniless in obscurity. Um, uh, specifically, he wrote uh, songs that I think are evoked by stories in this, uh, in this album, such as A Telltale Heart, in which someone's guilt manifests itself as the heart of someone who's murdered beating under the floorboards. Uh, the Raven, a short story in which a man projects a loss of his loved one onto the incoherent garblings of a bird that is perched at his window, or more pertinently, the the cask of a mont I can't pronounce the wine. The one about the Montiato. Thank you. That one, in which someone buries an enemy of his alive in his wine cellar, um, which seems to capture the dual fascinations with human darkness, death, and alcoholism that this album explores. Um, an obvious comparison is, you know, a particular Tom Waits records, I think, were evoked for me by this album. Yeah, that um, I also think a lot of the song titles evoke a lot of classic authors. So at different points, I was reminded of um, E.M. Forrester's Maurice. I've already mentioned Poe. Um, and also War and Peace by Tolstoy at points in, in the way it looks at war. And also I'm reminded of various smoky Russian bars that you might to expect to find uh, the protagonist of the Werkmeister Harmonies in, um, even though that's not a Russian movie. That, that's a lovely reference, though. One of my favorite movies of all time, and a, a movie that does. I would say this this record's like more like Satan Tango than that than Werkmeister Harmonies. If we're going to make a tower comparison, but like it does have the same just sense a, of like existential gloom. Just a just a barrel of laughs all around. Yeah, I know. Cheery bloke. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but also the opening scene of Folk Meister Harmonies is one of the most like transcendently beautiful things I've oh. ever seen. Oh, it so is. It's so beautiful. You're right. When you're right. Yeah, right. we get it. You've all seen movies. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I would like to see this picture you speak of. It's good. It's real good. All right. So um, this album is uh, basically a sweet of songs that are sometimes short, sometimes quite long, but all of which uh, basically repeat a very short, almost sonnet, or very short poem again and again. Um, and they build upon a sense of uh, doom and atmosphere. You open with C.F. Bundy. Um, yeah, I love how long the song is, and you go so long without hearing any, any vocals at all. 
um, and it just cycles through textures, um, letting each one sit with you for the right amount of time. So variously you'll get dissonant strings coming in, you'll get faint wailing in the background that's not mixed very strongly, but it's there and it's unnerving. It, it sounds like someone has trapped David Gilmore in a small box um, <laughs> next to you. I love um, that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the piano line descends with a melancholy that's like, like a ballerina dancing her way into hell with full knowledge of what she's doing. Um, and I, I love it. I love the, the guitar tones on this song, this album in general. It's not acoustic, but it's a clean electric. Um, and, and it gives it this uh, sense of, hmm, how do, how do I put this? It's, it's, it's very crisp and reverby. Um, and it just gives you this sense of like wailing detachment where, where you have someone sort of pulling at your leg straps, asking for help and you're powerless to help them. And this is all done in a very clean guitar tone. Um, if this album is one long bender, this is inviting you in the door, uh, stating to you, do you think you can survive the night? Um, in this song, this bar reminds me of John Paul Sartre's No Exit, in which a group of pe disparate people are trapped in a room that they soon realize is hell that they can't get out of. But the room in this case is a bar that's open all night. Um, Track two, trying to explain uh, the short poem in this case. I was trying to talk to you, but you couldn't hear. I was ex trying to explain to you, but you wouldn't listen. And when I wrote it down, you couldn't see what was written. Um, this sort of introduces the dual emotional plot lines you'll see on this record of ruined relationships and war being sort of not motivators for the drinking, but triggers for the darkness that was already there to consume you. Um, this is a very, again, a very dissonant song with a lot of very, uh, with a lot of descending guitar lines. It, it feels like a sad waltz, you know. Um, it's also one of the shortest songs clocking in uh, just shy of two, just over two minutes. Um, it is the only song under five on the record. Um, so whilst there isn't much to say, this feels like um, if the first song invites you in, this is where they explain to you what you're in for. Um, track three is a guilty party uh, is one of the most sort of more heavily vocal songs um, you get these harmonies that haunt and wail uh, so you've won I'll get the gun we can never erase the stupid things we've done um, where it feels like these these two people looking each other square in the eye and acknowledging how much they've hurt each other and that these things cannot be undone and that basically the whole relationship is fucked. Um, this for me is, is the start of the bender, um, where truth spills forth when you look into the glass and you see the end, but you keep going. Um, I think we've all been to a point of sozzled where we just spout forth our deepest emotional truths involuntarily. I've definitely been there on this very podcast. On a, I was fucking about <laughs> to say that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you have uh, wailing brass instruments as well that lend a real sense of funereal uh, carnivalesque atmosphere actually um, it almost reminds you of Fellini's Satyricon in many ways what the brass does on this record or, or like a Hodorowsky movie um, yeah um, it just it, it makes you feel like you're stuck there as the world moves around you um, at, at this point I was already feeling pretty done um, little did I know where this record would go. Track four is called What's Wrong. Um, and this song um, implements uh, a unique quality on the record by having a driving uh, uh, sort of a brushed snare um, that almost like a marching band, but much softer, like on Quaaludes. Um, but given the, <laughs> given the tone of this film, of this uh, album, sorry, that's excitement. Um, again, this is one of the most heavily vocal songs on the record, even if the lyrics are quite spare. An eye for an eye leaves us all blind, um, being the constant refrain uh, with uh, flowers for you yet again, and the tear-stained cheeks never end being thrown in as well for repetition. Um, 
Yeah, and this incredibly haunting and depressing poem, um, it feels like the conclusion of the narrative of the first half of the record. Before, our protagonist goes and is paid to murder people in the name of the state military. Um, and this is why I feel in so many ways, like on the song, What the Fuck Am I Doing on This Battlefield, reminded of Tolstoy, um, because he weaves similar themes in similar ways. Um, track five is The Kursk, um, which leads on with rumbling noise and explosions invoking ideas of war and PTSD. Um, it introduces, uh, about halfway through, uh, a strings in the lower register, like cellos and double basses, that do lend it um, this, this sort of register of impending doom that is inevitable and that you march towards knowing the fate which awaits you. Um, many songs evoke this feeling specifically in the context of being a soldier that remind me of the story of soldiers in World War I going over the top. Uh, there's a line later about generals who make decisions away from the battle condemning men to death, um, which I think very clearly evokes that idea in the way it has become poetically canonized. Um, it's only six minutes and five seconds in that lyrics happen on this song and, and, and boy are they chilling. I'm cold, I'm afraid. It's been like this for a day. The water is rising and slowly we're dying. We won't see light again. We won't see our wives again. It's a constantly repeating refrain on this song. Um, again, uh, even as the song builds and builds in dread, there are repetitious melodies on instruments like the piano and the guitar that repeat and guide you through this sort of emotional torpor. Um, every time it reaches the top of its ascending progression, it's about three seconds worth of harmonic resolution before it plunges you back into this endlessly descending chord progression and it, br it bring in satanic wailing um, that it, it just makes you feel con like a condemned man. Track six is a waste of blood, again, invoking ideas of uh, being a soldier of many men wasted. Um, with the concept, with the refrain, and that's why we died, uh, repeated again and again and again. Um, decisions were made by some corporate ingrates, put a price on all our lives, happens all the time. Again, invokes this idea of, of being a wasted life in the military, where your life is dictated by people you will never see or meet. Um, it has this it sounds played backwards with horribly distorted vocals, um, making you feel like you are slowly losing your mind. Um, what the fuck am I doing on this battlefield? Track seven. Um, again, yeah, it's a more slow and quiet moment of respite, clocking in at a relatively short five minutes and 16 seconds. And it is, it is a necessary moment of respite. So we're about to go into track eight, final track, The Maid We Messed, a 20 minute opus. Um, it's a pure instrumental. Um, again, the first half, the maid, invokes ideas of misuse of power, of infidelity, um, of these old tiny characters living in a mansion, like completely fucking each other up, sort of uh, Age of Innocence style, you know. Um, and again, the maid we messed just invokes this uh, feeling of anger and bitterness and regret. Like this is fucking, we fucked each other up. And it has that unflinchingness that other songs on this record about relationships have, where there's no hiding what we have done to each other. And we're not going to try to hide it from ourselves. Um, it builds slowly with a uh, funereal guitars um, integrated into this rich textured somber uh, tapestry of like haunting beauty. Um, it's just like three different guitars, I want to say, all playing different melodies that interact with each other and build on each other. Um, you can feel the exhaustion and existential emptiness as this happens, and this is just the beginning. An electronic drum beat comes in, um, and it builds and it builds and it builds um, whilst interacting with the different instruments on the track. Um, throwing in surprising elements at different times, like there'll be um, a snare drum here where you least expect it, or a really glitchy crash cymbal there. Um, all while the other instruments continue to, to work like a pallbearer almost, um, slowly carrying you into the grave as you transcend into the afterlife, that being the electronic 
uh, almost IDM style drum track that plays as this happens. Gradually fuzzy noise and electronic synths come in um, and, it, and it teases and teases and teases you, building and building and building and building, refusing to, to break into uh, whatever it's building to. And then 20 minutes have happened. And the album is over and it kept building the whole time and it just leaves you alone with your thoughts to, to process what you've just listened to for an hour and six minutes, especially the 20 minute opus of a closer. For me, this album is like the ultimate, we're gonna make you feel bleak purely with instruments here, with, with music, this is like the power of music to make you feel like shit. Um, and in a way, I apologize for making you all listen to that, but I, I think it's worth the experience. Um, I, I love this record. I first heard it about four years ago, just uh, browsing YouTube videos of full albums that were online. And uh, this caught my eye for obvious reasons, because the packaging is very eye-catching. Um, and I slowly got lost in this transcendent, beautiful, strange mess of a record that I love with all of my heart. Um, yes, it's sad and yes, it's bleak, but um, it has so many joys along the way. And for me, the appeal of this record is I, I'm just going to sit here in this mood you've created. And, and as I have a lot of darkness inside me, and this record channels that in an artistically constructive way, it makes me feel like someone's given me music that understands what I am in my darkest moments. Just it's sound. It does that. The lyrics are tangential in a way. It's the sound that does it. This is for me like one of the peak examples of what pure sound can do in music. And, and I fucking love it. That is well fucking said, Sersha. I think that you you put the appeal of it in, uh, in an interesting way and in it, like it's hard to, to describe the appeal because, you yeah. know, it's concentrated human misery. I actually yeah. didn't only hear this um, for this podcast either. I listened to this a couple of months back because I had a shitty ass day at work and mm. I felt like garbage. So naturally, I go to Tyler and I ask. This was this was way <laughs> before the podcast happened. I go to yeah. Tyler and I'm like, Tyler, give me an album that uh, that, that that's for feeling like shit. And you were just like, you gave me like a list. And Drinking Songs was one of them. And then I think Sersha may have spoken up and was just like, yeah, I love is. Drinking Songs. And I was like, okay, Drinking Songs it is. And like, I had no context for what the fuck it was. I just put it on because I felt like garbage. And then I put it on and was just like, maybe this, maybe I need to like, this mm -hmm. might be a little bit too much right now. And like I, I got through like the first I think two songs and was just like this is this is potent I'm gonna save this for another day and I did, um, and then I listened to it and I think a lot of the appeal of this album is in the same appeal that I find in a lot of doom metal uh, specifically a specific genre of it which is a uh, funeral doom which is the the slowest heaviest sludgiest kind uh, of doom metal which is focused a lot on uh, it's like also a lot of blackened doom metal. Um, Bell Witch's Mirror Reaper has the same energy as this. Um, it just has this sort of apocalyptic, lumbering kind of nature to it. But uh, Serge also brought up uh, Tom Waits, who I also thought about, and that this album's kind of like a dream combination for me, and that I feel like it is the lyric, lyrical and thematic approach of Tom in his earliest moments, but with the experimental variety of the stuff that he did in his late career stuff, like on even stuff on like Bad Is Me kind of reminds me of the way he talks about war and stuff like that. Um, Real Gone, um, Bone Machine, stuff like that. But through the lens of something like Closing Time or um, even Frank's Wild Years in a sense, because it's just about being in this like drunken fucking swath. Um, but I, I love this record. I, I think that I, I am grateful that you put this on here because I kind of had to force myself to listen to it yeah. again. And the first thing I thought when I finished it the first time was like, okay, I, I didn't like, I loved that, but I need to like listen to this again to properly get it all together. And the thing is, it's just like, but I don't really, I, don't, I, I gotta be in a, some type of mood to do this. 
Um, I don't want to. So, yeah. <laughs> so putting me in that space, uh, I was able to do that. Um, C.F. Bundy. Great start. Uh, it starts with these lonely guitar chords uh, and these almost like New Orleans sounding funeral horns that just like somberly lumber in the background. Uh, the vocals here mixed just distantly enough to sound despondent. The twinkling piano really makes it feel like you're in this sad, shitty bar wallowing in your sorrow. Very, very Tom Waits. Um, and uh, I love the aching sounding strings that show up. Uh, the way this track builds, and pretty much every track builds, like structurally, this album is sublime. Uh, trying to explain. This song is menacing. These pitched down satanic vocals. It's it's demonic. It's it's the it's like the voice of, of, of like suicidal ideation in your head, like poking and prodding at you. But it also gets to this sort of theme of being like an artist being completely unable to communicate with the people around them. And that's like the more I think about this song, the more utterly horrifying it becomes, because this is like conceptually this is hell for an artist this is basically what if everything you did to express yourself and communicate with other people was completely unable to be interpreted by them what if the people around you just completely didn't get it and and the the part of yourself that is most honest and put in the most passion to is something that people don't understand and that feeling of isolation is carried through the album but like this planting it there is so poignant um, the Guilty Party is a song about reveling in being a miserable failure. Uh, the piano and guitar kind of synced up in the intro of the song are perfect. Uh, the harmonies are sort of just off enough to feel like uh, the, a group of people are singing in this track, which makes it all the more ominous, but also makes you feel like a bunch of people in the bar that this takes place in are drunkenly singing this wallowing song together. Um, What's Wrong, it, it sort of picks up the tempo a bit, by this album's standards at least, it's not a fast song. Uh, I like the, the variety and the mood, um, but I will say if, of, of every song here, this probably leaves the faintest impressions uh, on me. I like what it does structurally, uh, it's well suited to how the album is paced, uh, it's a good song, it's just mainly surrounded by better ones. Um, uh, the Kursk. Uh, a song that I think I read, um, it might have been on Genius or whatever, uh, but it is a song that I think Matt Elliott himself said is dedicated to those who were lost at sea. Um, it's a watery sea dirge from hell. It is these the discordant strings just wail in the background at the start. The vocals sound like a choir of dead souls. Uh, then there's A Waste of Blood, a song about the futility of life under the powers that be, very working class kind of song, a group of people who were crushed by a corporation, crying out that they died for no other reason uh, other than the fact that they were small. Uh, it reverses at the end. It becomes this lonely sounding song. It sounds like it's in a faraway chamber. Uh, what the fuck am I doing on this battlefield? Another song about the futility under the greater powers. Um, and holy shit, this song is effective. The gang vocals just sort of reprising the line of, it will always hurt and so say all of us. This is a, a, a tortured, strained ballad. It's progression to a more intimate guitar-driven tune at the very end is fucking beautiful. And then you have sort of the, 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 the final hurrah of the Made We Mess. Uh, originally described by me, this is an Uzumaki, uh, the story <laughs> by Junji Ito, uh, style descent into the deepest pit of hell, and I, I stand by that even more now. It's basically the entire climax to that story. It's the sort of image that it conjures in my head. It's the reversed instrumentation at the start gives it a deeply unsettling vibe. It sort of gives you that sort of weird sonic timbre that you only get from um, instrumentation that's been reversed that you can sort of immediately identify when it happens. Um, and then it sort of progresses into a song that feels like it's being played by a ship crew of a boat that's very slowly sinking in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and slowly but surely, it sounds like a fucking IDM beat just starts to come into this song. And it begins to encompass and swallow it entirely. Uh, and slowly but surely, it does this, and it spirals into this distorted noise as though the song itself is being strangled. 
and the instrumentation just sort of goes and becomes more and more lumbering and ultimately ultimately it is swallowed by a huge wall of noise it's like it's being eaten by the gaping maw of a lovecraftian beast and I, I love how long it is. Like, I don't think it outstays its welcome at all, and I think it needs to be this long to accomplish what it's doing to the uh, severity uh, to which it is doing it. It's, it's punishing, it's brutal, it's effective, and there's just no album that, like, truly understands bottom-of-the-barrel misery quite mm -hmm. like this. You, you have to be in a special mood to listen to it and appreciate it, but I, I think that it's, it, it's adventurous, it's very, like structurally audacious and it, it keeps you guessing and it's it, it's just a phenomenal record like i i love it a lot and i wish i could listen to it more without feeling like garbage yeah good review we all got one of them or <laughs> sometimes few. our favorite slister can most or, of those records. yeah or a hundred <laughs> yeah like i'm reminded of uh the golden devil um Particularly. The God and the Devil. Yeah, we've all got wooden nails. We churn out hate in factories. You know that shit. <laughs> That's that 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 would be a set of lyrics that would belong on this album. That's actually. That's I think. Apt. I, I like obviously the, for us as people, the Tom Waits comparison is an obvious one, and it, you know it's it's good, obvious because it fits. But to me, what that what the comparison, like the, the crossover comparison that came to mind when I was listening to this, is it's like. Tom Waits joined Red House Painters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's it's slow. It's a slow. I was, course. I was I, the first thing that came to my mind was Giles Corey. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, well, yes. Well, yes. Giles Corey is basically if Red House Painters got like suicidally depressed, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah. So I'm 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 correct. You are correct. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a slow core record, so it comes from a particular lineage of albums that take kind of aesthetics or sounds from like sort of like folk music and and yeah, and that kind of scene and sort of as you would expect from the genre title, slow things down and make it more methodical and 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 gives it sort of room to breathe and and often those records like i think of a band like low for example who make those kinds of records who are very kind of sad and and yeah and you kind of just sink into them and they kind of overwhelm you and drinking songs is a as a perfect example of a record like that um i hadn't actually dug too much into the lyrical subject matter or content or themes of the record uh, up to this point so it was really refreshing to hear Sarah to do that and also obviously to hear Jake's insights as well. Um, I didn't write a terrible amount about this record. To me, I, I think when we were doing our previous episode, Morgan said that this is kind of a record that feels like one cohesive piece of music that you just kind of absorb and, and goes through these different kind of phases. And I, I think that's a really inspired uh, thought and a great way to consider the record, honestly. Uh, and, and gives its final movement, I think, a lot more of a punch. Um, but yeah. I, I it, can't stress enough how that final movement comes the fuck out of nowhere when you're listening to this album for the yeah. first time and don't know it. And you're yeah. just like, uh, 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 Yeah, uh. you know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, interesting to note how much the doing this podcast and just knowing you all in general has changed the way I sort of think about music is because when the, you know, the beat dropped <laughs> on this album, I, I, I was just like, huh. I wasn't like, wait, what? What just yeah. happened? I was just like, oh, love all cool. yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, yeah. Um, this album to me is like, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a 66 minute gradually uh, intensifying spiral um, and, and you really feel that it's like it's like falling into a pit of darkness and the whole experience is like watching the the circle of light that you came from just gradually get smaller and smaller and the darkness and the noise of, of where you're going get louder and louder it's like that we, we just um, uh, it's like Jake and I and Morgan watched the house that Jack built the other day, and it's kind of like this is a, yeah. the same vibe as the epilogue yeah. of that movie. Yep. <laughs> um, anyway, 
Uh, the IDM beat is the needle drop is... of, of at the end when it plays Hit the Road, Jack. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Based. <laughs> yeah. Because that, that epilogue has um, this incredible, uh, incredible feat of sound design where they have this kind of like distant but yeah. uh, sharp drilling sound that's supposed to signify the screams of everyone who's ever been to hell kind of coalescing into this one abhorrent noise. And to me, this record is like hearing that noise grow closer and closer. Um, and and you're, except you're alive and it's real and you can't kind of escape it. Um, there's no pit to fall into. You're just trapped already. Um, anyway, see if Bundy is a somber uh, opening. Um, uh, again, like I said, the sound of spiraling, I think you get epitomized immediately on this opener. I adore Chris Cole's bleeding cello contributions to this track, which scratch and claw at the fabric of the mix. And I think beautifully um, symbolize a bubbling anxious pain that seems to be lurching upward out of Matt's drunken stupor. Um, and there's a lot of instances on this record, the um, obviously the drum and bass break and the maybe we missed being the most obvious one that where you kind of get a very particular uh, instrumental contribution that clearly seems to be a comment on or a symbolization of a particular emotional state that's happening. Um, the Guilty Party has a music box feel, uh, a kind of arcane beauty that feels tinged with aching for the past. Uh, the Kursk is the incredibly gloomy, extended passage of these haunted vocals. Um, and, and again, The Maid We Missed is just an incredible finale that incorporates uh, drum and bass for a 20-minute swirling vortex of gin-soaked paranoia and collapse. Uh, where much of this album, I think, captures treading the line between consciousness and death through a slow, crawling arrangement that feels like the wheezing of a weakened heart, this, is a, this finale is a cavalcade of chaos that feels like the tape of the preceding 45 minutes has unspooled and is layering atop itself, glitching, squealing, and building into some nightmare mutate, mutant version of itself. Like it's, it, I it really cannot be impressed enough how the flow of this record is impeccable and crucial to the effect of its final twist. Like it's, it's, it's really something else. Um, yeah, amazing, amazing record. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I'll be honest. Uh, my my first impression of this album uh, before listening to it was that it was going to be the worst thing ever uh, based on the <laughs> title, the cover art, the track listing. It just looked like the least appealing fucking slug of all time. Okay. However, well, I, was, I mean uh, that that is partially true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's what you get on the tin. Yeah, uh, I mean, however, in a sense, I I was uh, I was surprised pleasantly because I uh, I thought this was a pretty good album. Uh, you know, you've got uh, C. F. Bundy, which no relation to uh, Ted, <laughs> is uh, this kind of really interesting really nice uh, very orchestral operatic sounding piece that just swells and swoons and kind of pulls you deeper into this this depth of misery i'm i'm very much a fan of the i i kind of personally i dig the the production and sound of this album i think it gives it a lot of sharpness a lot of color a lot of character to the instrumentation really what's what's so amazing for about this is just uh by in on in most cases kind of pulling back the lyrical presence this album is able to do a whole lot more for me than i feel if it had more lyrics to it because the songs are able to speak for themselves, really. The instrumentals, that is. Uh, you know, you've got the Guilty Party, which I thought was some of the best 
use of vocals on the project, providing uh, atmosphere for the most part, uh, lyrically. Although I do tend not to find myself that interested in the words being spoken. It's just, I'm there for the tone of it. And the tone is really cool. It's very haunting, thickly layered, and it just sticks with you. I, I mean, I find describing a lot of the individual tracks to be kind of pointless because while they're different enough that the LP doesn't feel like this massive stale blob, I feel they all get a, get across pretty much the same emotional beats for me. However, I think the weakest moments are the tracks that that really don't develop themselves a whole lot. Like uh, there's particularly, I think it's the... It's the second song, I believe, that's like two minutes long. That's especially a case of this where I feel we're just carrying over ideas from the song preceding it and not really going a whole lot of new places. Uh, now, this is all in like stark contrast to this just insane closer, uh, The Made We Messed. I think one of the most brilliant endings you could have to this kind of album where you just spend like five, six minutes building up until this beat drop where it becomes this atmospheric drum and bass song. And it's, it's just so cool. I love it. And it's, and it's because of his prior experience, or I think it was prior with uh, the third eye foundation that really brings this track home for me because if this had just if if matt elliott had gone into this as just a folk album producer who was just gonna i'm gonna make an i uh make an idm song it would it would have been terrible but because he's going into this with experience it it kicks ass and yeah i think this record is pretty good yeah, um, you know, is uh, is a searcher recommended album? Guy named Matt Elliott album called Drinking Songs, with the cover that it had. <laughs> uh, to put it bluntly, I was expecting some folk punk. Um, sure. Not not what I got. Not what I got at all. Um, what I got was something I have never really heard before. Um, the Tom Waits comparisons are obvious. I think there's definitely some uh, Nick Cave murder ballads. Yep. Um, I already mentioned Giles Corey. Um, those are just sonic comparisons and somewhat emotional response comparisons in some way. Um, but a lot of what this album brought to mind in terms of emotional reactions were records like uh, Manic Street Preacher's Holy Bible, which I think uh, somewhere down the line, I don't know when, we're going to have to do on a Record Club episode. That's a um, I think great it, pick. Holy shit. Yeah, I think it... Say about that one. Yeah. It's, it is going to be devastating, but it deserves it. Yes, um, 100%. Uh, but yeah, just finding the right time to do that will be something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, it's very clearly drinking songs is very morose and sort of gothic Victorian uh, in the sense that it evokes a lot of the feelings that Victorian literature like you know frankenstein for instance evokes um part of it definitely felt very civil war era as well both american and sort of english in its inspirations um but that might also just be me leaning into giles corey a little bit um but anyway these are lots of things and ideas that i find really fascinating um particularly with the historical 
and literature elements of it. And I feel like it really perfectly captures those uh, pieces that it's indebted to um, through a sort of sonic palette, which is um, beautiful and hollowing all at the same time, which is, you know, it's, it's what a lot of us like in our music. Uh, <laughs> to feel like it's, garbage. It's a re- yeah. But I will say it never, um, to me at least, it never became overbearing. There was always a sort of, I'm trying to think of the right way to put this, there's always a sort of pulpiness to it, I think, that sort of lends it some distance. Um, like sonically, something that came to mind a lot was actually the great mouse detective the sound some of the songs on here sound Holy like what would be playing shit, you're right in radigan's bar and it's like yeah. you know i can i sort of ascribe it to that and then i sort of it almost becomes comforting for me because that film is complete comfort food um but it's it's like that's that movie's sort of musical motifs and general atmosphere uh, ramped up to a not exactly kid-friendly audience. Um, yeah. yeah, a bit, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say I enjoyed every single second of this. Um, I think the last song is actually pretty perfect. Um, but I find both, I think the problem that I can point to most definitely is the first and second songs, where the first one is just a hair too long, I think, Mm -hmm. um, and the second one is a hair too short. Um, the one feels a bit overdeveloped and sort of feels like it spins its wheels to me, and the one that follows it does not feel developed enough. Um, but otherwise, this is a really incredible mood and tone piece with a really fascinating story to tell, and I enjoyed it immensely. God, it makes me so happy to hear that. I lived to, great. I lived to serve. <laughs> All right. All right. Anyone Thanks else? Try. Yeah, we'll do our favorite tracks and ratings. Um, I'll go first this time, just to switch up our normal flow. Cool. Yeah, let's um, do like reverse order. Uh, so my my three favorite tracks are, uh, oh, I think I think the three longest. Hang on, let me check. Um, <laughs> yeah, see if Bundy, the Kursk, and obviously my the highlight of the record being the astounding Made We Missed. Uh, least favorite track. If I had to pick one, I'd probably pick. Um, uh, yeah, probably pick trying to explain. Uh, I think this is a really good record. I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. Nice. Um, okay, so that's me. Um, favorite tracks, Made We Messed, obviously, uh, The Kursk. Uh, and I've already given a group title of Curran, uh, CF Bundy as well. Um, I'm going to give this record an 8 and out of 10. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Um. I. I will. I did say that I didn't really write down. Three favorite tracks for this. Um. But I I can identify them. I do want to shout out. Uh, the guilty party, obviously the maid we missed, and um. Yeah, probably the cursed. Um. If I had to pick a, pick a least favorite, it'd probably be trying to explain, but um, there's nothing I dislike about it. I just think it's not enough. Um, but yeah, I'm also thinking an eight and a half. Nice. All right. So my three favorite tracks are uh, CF Bundy, 
The Kursk and the maid we missed. My least favorite is uh, trying to explain, which was the song I was referring to, and I'd give this album a five out of ten. Oh, oh shit! I mean eight. Sorry, that was my cutty notes. <laughs> wow, I was yeah, re- I was uh, genuinely drunk for a second. I, I, I yeah, I was just. Like, I was like, oh. that didn't that didn't match up at all. <laughs> Yeah, no, eight. Sorry, that's funny. That is very funny. Oops. Jake. Kill my three favorite tracks. I'm going to give some love to Trying to Explain just because I love what that does like on a thematic level. I think it's pretty good. Uh, trying to Explain, The Maid We Messed, got to throw that in there. And I'll say, um, yeah, The the Guilty Party, definitely. Um, Just a song about feeling like shit mm-hmm. and uh least favorite track is what's wrong and uh i give it a nine out of ten chill all right so that's an 8.8 on average which lines up with uh yushimi battles of ink robots ultra visitor age of ads fantastic yeah uh, really uh. Nice to get some. Cons- uh, it's always nice to have a wee consensus record in Record Club. It's fun. Mm. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Tyler, next yeah. week is yours. Yeah, next week is my recommended record, uh, uh, a much beloved uh, alt rock slash emo record from 2003, I think, called The Meadowlands by a band called The Wrens. Uh, so that's a very uh, important record to me. So go ahead, go away and listen to it if you're watching at home and tune in for that episode next week uh yeah that's basically it let us know in the comments mm-hmm. what you think of drinking songs by matt elliott if you've watched this out of curiosity and haven't heard it obviously go and listen to it um and yeah that's basically it for today uh rock over london rock on chicago bounty the quicker picker upper <laughs>